and Zainab. Um, so my talk today is going to be on do fish have legs? Um, so we'll start with you know, just, a, just a few questions to the audience, um, just to set the mood. Uh, how many of you are what you'd call back-end developers? Here, hands up. Oh, OK, so that's uh, much more than I was expecting, so about 90% of you, I think. Uh, what about front-end developers? Much fewer, 10%. That's great. <laughs> um, OK, so of those who are back-end developers, how many of you have needed to implement APIs for front ends? Cool, all of you. Great. And so I'm sure you'll, uh, you know what I mean when, when I say that APIs are hard to implement. You usually start off with a very simple use case, and it grows more complex. And eventually, it becomes you know, quite hard to maintain, maybe buggy, maybe slow. Um, let me introduce a scenario. Let's imagine that we're a backend developer and we're uh, employed by a company which um, is called PetCorp. And PetCorp is like an adoption center for pets. And what they have is, is that they have people who want to actually, uh, actually adopt pets. And they go onto the website and they search for the, their pets and they pick a pet that they want. And so maybe as a backend developer, we need to implement an API which looks something like this. Pretty standard, so I don't know if you can see, but it's like a post endpoint with search with the name is equal to Fido. And so this would allow us to search for pets whose name is equal to Fido. And this is all well and good for maybe like a week or two. And then the clients come back and say, well, you know what we really need? We really need to be able to search by age as well. And so as backend developers, you know, we, we add an extra parameter, which looks something like that. You know, so Fido and the age is equal to three. And this is good. You know, we've done the simplest thing that we can at each point in time. And then they come back again. And they want to restrict the range of ages because they want dogs between, I don't know, the age of three and six. And so it looks like this. And then, you know, a month after, they, they also want to, uh, something even more complex. And eventually, you get this mess. Does this sound familiar to, to anyone here? I have a confession to make. You know, I have done this at least three times in three different languages. And a while back, I wanted to know what I'd actually done. And I thought a little bit, and I thought, well, to be honest, I've actually implemented a language. And then after you know, a few more weeks, I thought, well, surely I can't be the only person who's done this. And it turns out I'm not. It turns out that this is so common that there's actually a name for it. There's actually a rule. And so I introduce Greenspun's 10th rule. Any sufficiently complicated C or Fortran program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of common Lisp. And I felt really down. Because this rule makes it seem like a really bad thing, right? And so I got to thinking a little bit more. And I was like, well, is this really so bad? I mean, a few of these things here are you know, like slow, bug-ridden. They're not that great, right? But I propose that we, tonight, revise this rule. I propose that we have a, an extra rule, which is any sufficiently complicated Scala program should contain a formally specified bug-free implementation of common Lisp. And uh, that's the beginning of my talk, really. So quick primer on Lisp. Um, how many of you in the room actually have seen a Lisp before? All right, a fair few. So this will look familiar. Um, this is a Lisp expression. Uh, the first argument here, uh, sorry, the first element in the list is the function, and it's applied to these individual arguments. This thing here is a sub-expression, um, which also gets evaluated for plus a and b. And these ones without the quotes around them are known as symbols. And this is a string. And, and these can be, yeah, the true and false are also symbols as well. So if we were to implement this inside Scala, it'd be quite simple to do. And it might look something like this. So these are the case classes for a Lisp 
in Scala. We have our expression here. We have literals. We have numbers and strings. And we have symbols and function application. This is a Lisp. Um, but you know, once I've actually written a Lisp program, I'd like to be able to evaluate it because it's you know useless otherwise. So how do we do that? Well, oh sorry, and this is an example of a Lisp program that we had earlier. So name of the pet is equal to Fido. So we have apply function application. We have the symbolic link here, and then we have name pet and Fido. Uh, so how do we actually evaluate it? Well, in the case that we have literals here, it's really simple. So here's our eval function. We have apply. We have a type A because we don't actually know what gets returned. But in the case that we have numbers and strings, then we just return it, the, the value which is uh, actually wrapped. On the other hand, symbols and function application are a little bit more complex. And in order to uh, actually deal with the case of symbols, we need to introduce a new concept, the idea of a context. And a context is simply a map of symbols to objects, um, in our case, with one function, which is lookup. And here's an example of a context uh, which we might evaluate under. Uh, this has a symbol plus, which actually has the function plus inside it. And so we've dealt with the symbol use case, because you know, at this point, it writes itself. We just look up the uh, symbol in the context, and then we return that. What about the application case? Well, it's a little bit more complex. But the great thing about Lisp is that most languages contain a subset of it, including, as it happens, Scala. So here we are. We're going to actually use Scala's function application to evaluate our Lisp. So what we do here is that we find a function. Well, first of all, at the top, we have our app function application. We have a symbol, which is the name of our function. We have arguments. And what we do is that we get the length of the arguments, and we get the function from the context, and we just apply the function using Scala's function application. Um, and this is fantastic. We've got an evaluator. And uh, I'm just going to, hopefully, this demo goes well, but uh, I'm just going to show, show it working. Uh, OK. So I'm just going to go through the code a little bit first. So this is our pet. Uh, hang on. Can you guys see the code now? Excellent. So here's our uh, case classes with dog and cat here. We've got our symbols, name and age. And we've got the actual lambdas here, uh, which you know tell us actually what to do to evaluate them. Um, so I'm just going to open the console now. It should be a bit bigger. Uh, so what was I going to do? Well, expr. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so I've, I've written a parser, which basically parses a Lisp expression um, so that you guys can see it a little bit easier. So let's say that I want the uh, age of the pet. Um, and we actually want to parse this. So we've got our function application. We've got age. We've got a list of symbols. And then we want to create a context. So I actually remember the method. There we go. So pet.eval context. And let's say we've got pet.dog. Dog's name is Fido. Age is 3. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And then we just want to evaluate it with the expra and context, as we had earlier. And we get our result. Great. But you know, as we said earlier, like your use cases change. And now, let's say that the shop actually adds an extra you know, pet. Let's say that it adds fish, something like this. And fish has like, uh, you know, and, and suddenly they've added an extra parameter, which is the number of legs that animals have. I'm not really sure why they do that, but you know, it's, it's the only thing that I could think of it off, off the top of my head. Um, the fish don't have legs, or well, we don't. We hope they don't anyway. So, can anyone tell me what they think will happen if I evaluate this program? Let me just write it first. <laughs>
Uh, cool. Anyone guess what will happen if I evaluate this program on a fish? <coughs> Sorry, what was that? The of the fish. Pardon? The of the fish. Uh, I think, let me just go back to the thing. of the actual part itself. So, hang on. Here's the actual code. So I think I heard it earlier, which was, uh, someone said a match fail, I think. It was up. Cool, excellent, yeah. You'll get a match fail. And I mean, I can show that as well. Um, uh, sorry, it's now a new pet. Uh, And Nemo, poor Nemo here doesn't actually have. There we go. We get a match error. So what's actually gone wrong? What we need is a type system. Because we were able to write a, a program which should not have been valid. So I'd like you to think of a type system as a set of rules which constrain what programs can be written and what programs can't be written. And we're just going to give this a go. So let's just do it through trial and error, OK? This is our object typer, and this is the result of our typer. And a typer is just going to give us a type. And in the case that our program is invalid, it's going to return a string with the error and the expression which is invalid itself. And well, what can we do at the beginning? Well, first of all, sorry, our goal is to be able to type this program incorrectly. Because pet can, you know, pets should not be able to be, we should never basically have a match error at runtime. Okay. So let's start by defining what types we know about. We know about numbers, strings, and booleans, those are our literals, and we know about functions. So the simplest type system that we can come up with is very similar to our evaluator last time. In the case that we have numbers and strings, we just return those types, you know, type.num and type.str. But in the case that we have symbols and apply, it's a little bit more complex. But this looks really familiar. And to be honest, we use the same algorithm. We also introduce the idea of a context, which we look up for symbols to get their types. But the apply case is a little bit more complicated than that. And so we'll introduce the first rule, because remember I said that type systems are a set of rules. And it's fairly self-explanatory. And that is a function needs to be applied to arguments of the correct type and the correct length. So here we have the Lisp expression, f of x and y. And if f is of type a to b to c, then x needs to be of type a y needs to be of type b, and the whole expression will return a type c. This is pretty good, but it doesn't solve our problem. What type is pet? If we introduce a type pet, then we'll have the same problem we had earlier, because we'll allow the legs of pet. We want to restrict bad programs, but we also want to be, allow good programs to be written. So what do we do at this point? Well, we need to make the type system more powerful. So we're going to introduce a coproduct type, which is a set of types that something can be. So now we say that pets can be dogs, cats, or fish. OK. And we also define the idea of a subtyping. And the subtype of A, uh, sorry, A is considered a subtype of B in these particular cases. But I mean, I'm not going to go through them in much detail, but if A is equal to B, if uh, A is not a coproduct and, it's, and B is a coproduct and A is inside B, or all the A's exist inside B uh, that A can be. So now our new rule is going to be a function needs to be applied to arguments of the correct type or a subtype of that type. So again, we have the same scenario. 
But x now can be a subtype of a, and y can now be a subtype of b. And this is pretty good. But we also have further complications um, in our typing system. What should this return? Well, previously, we wouldn't be able to write this program, right? Because essentially, one of them returns string on this branch, and one of them returns number. So again, we need to make this type system slightly more powerful. We'll define what a union of types are. So a union of types is just basically mashing both of those types together. In the case one is a, a code product and the other is a code product, it's the set of all of them. In the case that one is not, then it gets added to the other, etc. So this is another rule that we have now. In the if statement, if we have two different types being returned, we'll then return a union. I mean, we always return a union anyway because of how unions are defined in this type system. But we go back to our original problem, and we still haven't answered the question, what should legs be? Should it be dog to cat to fish to int or dog to cat to int? If it's the first case, then we're too permissive, and we'll have the match error that we had before. But in the second case, we won't be able to type check this ever. So does anyone have any ideas what we can do to, to address this problem? Maybe something that you've seen in Scala. Anyone? All right. Well, it's similar to a match expression, right? Because in the match expression, what we want to do is that we want to narrow the type that pet can be. But I'd like to do a little bit better, because to be honest, I think match expressions are a little bit clunky for our use case. So let's, let, let's imagine what we can do. Let's imagine something like this. Let's have the syntax is. So we want to say, is pet a fish? But what should it return? Well, in the runtime case, it's quite obvious. It should return a Boolean. And if the runtime value is true, we want the typer to infer that it's a fish. And if the runtime value is false, we want the typer to infer that it's not a fish. But how can we go about this using this information for the typer at compile time? Well, there's only one construct which can actually do this uh, to, you know, to check whether this value is true or false. And that's our if statement from before. So here's like an example of a program which we might write. So if the pet is a fish, then this is our left branch. Otherwise, this is our right branch. And here, our typer should infer the pet should be a fish, and this pet should be anything else. OK? That's a little bit complicated. So how do we actually do that? So remember that our typer has a context when we're actually doing the typing itself. What we need to do is we need to edit the context. And also, the other problem that we have is, is at the moment, we've got a very constrained expression here, right? Is is like, uh, I mean, you could have a not of it is. And at that point, it would also change the bounds as well. Uh, so let's think a little bit more carefully about what this form should look like. What should go into A? What should we be able to check the type of? Well, to be honest, the most per permissive thing in our type system is any valid expression can go in A. We can check the name, for example, of the pet is a string. I mean, that should be valid. But what about B, which is a bit more interesting? Um, because B should be a type, right? And not only should B be a type, but we should make sure that B is a type that A can be. So there's no point, let's say, if A is a, you know, a string for us to be able, and we know it's a string, for us to, be, uh, us to check whether it's an int, for example, or a number. So we introduce this idea of a bound. And the bound is like a delta on this context. And we have to introduce a new operation, which is complement. Uh, and the reason why we have to do that is in the left branch, we want it to be not fish. And in the, uh, sorry, in the right branch, we want it to be not fish. And in the left branch, we want it to be fish. So we want to like the opposite, if you like. 
and we change the result the type of returns to also return a bound, which is like a delta which we'll apply on. And so our if statements are going to be slightly different now. Not only do they need to return a Boolean, but they'll also return a bound, which we'll use during the typing phase. So in this branch, we have B and C. And if A returns a bound, then we'll apply the bound here for B. Otherwise, we'll apply the complement of the bound. And we have to do similar things for different Boolean operations in this type of, uh, in, in this way. For example, if we do a not, we want to reverse the complement and the bound itself. Finally, we should have the ability to type check something like this. So just give a demo. Um, all right, so what was I going to do? <laughs> so I'm just going to show you. Oh, sorry, I've already got the uh, program, haven't I? Yeah, I think Expert's already there. So this is the thing which shouldn't type check. Um, and what we can do is let's go to a new pet. Mm. And then we have our typer with our typer context. And this doesn't type check. You can see that it's left here. So it doesn't type check. And then Uh, let's, uh, let's write a better program. So we'll do it if is pet fish. And we want to return a 1.0. Otherwise, we can return to legs pet. OK, that looks good. And voila. We've correctly inferred that it's num and it's a valid program. Cool. Um, now, the only part is, is that we need to write some runtime logic uh, to do the is matching, which is up here. I'll share the slides later anyway. So, But anyway, to recap, we created a Lisp AST. We then created an evaluator, which could run a program. And then we created a simple typer, and then made it more complex through iteration. Um, and to be honest, there's only a few key points which I'd like you guys to take away from this talk. First of all, it's really simple to create evaluators. I did it may maybe like 10 lines of code. Um, you can play around with evaluation and compilation strategies as well. Uh, so something which is really cool which you can do is that I, I wrote the most simple evaluator, but you can actually make an evaluator which will make use of the JIT compilation in the JVM. So for example, you can actually get this type of programming, uh, sorry, program running maybe five times about five times the speed of Python or something like that. Um, you can also you know, compile it into SQL statements, anything you like, really. The other thing is, is that type systems are also pretty simple. Um, the amount of code which it took to write this type system was maybe about 200 lines of code. Um, and it can be as expresses of, expresses, sorry, expressive as you want it to be. And to be honest, uh, I forgot to say, but the is statement which we created just now is actually more complicated than Scala's is, in is instance of. You can't do it in Scala. You can do it in some other languages, but you know, I think that's pretty cool. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah. Is this the right mic? Hello. I, I think I'm going to use this thing. What is, is this a mic? Yeah, it's a mic. I'm, I'm going to throw it around, around. I don't think I throw the whole thing. I think I throw this thing. <laughs>
Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Um, okay. I have a question. Yes. So that um, is statement. Yes. You basically inferred, um, yeah, so we, we inferred that uh, Pet was of type fish. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that in uh, any code that you write within the first branch of that if statement now, the type of that symbol pet is inferred to be a fish? Yes. So you can do fish specific stuff in there? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, yes, basically. Um, it's very similar to how, uh, I, I think Idris also has the same concept, um, though to be fair, I haven't really used it. Uh, but what it actually looks like is that in our typer, we have an expression um, which, which we basically look up before, before we search or uh, before we do any inference room. How complicated would it be to put uh, some more advanced um, rules in there? So, so how complicated, I suppose, would it be to lift it to almost the level that Idris does, where you can actually have any kind of value clause within that um, uh, within that uh, if statement? Here? Yeah. Oh, so. yeah, you can already do that. Um, so the is block here is implemented such that it's just any valid expression. So instead of just pet here, you can do like name of pet, and it just types that. So anything which has a valid type inside will work. Oh, that's awesome. But that's pretty cool that you can do that in, um, did you say less than 200 lines of Scala? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a little bit more, but like, so I go to the typer. About 200 lines. So. 188 exactly. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, OK, any other questions? We have a question at the back. I don't actually know if this is working, but we'll try. Hi. Um, so your initial example is about a REST API and query parameters. So yes. how does this relate to that? I didn't uh, quite okay. get the connection. Uh, so essentially, what I've done in the past is that I've created like a DSL. So rather than like hard coding like query parameters inside my search engine, I've just had something which compiles to a SQL query or something like that. The great thing about uh, controlling your DSL is that you can make it 100% safe. So like instead of like, for example, I mean, we all know that you shouldn't send SQL directly to the server, right? I mean, because you get SQL injection attacks, et cetera. But if you have like a program which you compile into SQL, you can make sure that it's safe. Um, so yeah, so you, you basically like send like a, like, I, I don't know if you've, have you seen like Jira? Have you used the Jira API before? Yeah. It's like well, JQL yeah, okay. basically. Okay. Um, it allows you to write stuff like JQL. Um, your own JQL really. Does that okay. sort of answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Cool. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the, um, uh, most difficult problems implementing the most basic time systems is to actually uh, keep track. I, I arrive late, but when you have uh, functions inside functions, yep. and you can have a you 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 can have the same parameter name in yes. each context. Yes, so yes. How 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 how, how, do you... how how do I handle it? Okay, so this is this is a great question, by the way, and the answer is I don't, and the reason I don't is because my language doesn't need it because I don't have, uh, so basically the only time in which you have that problem is when you can define functions themselves. And I explicitly disallow that in this programming language. You cannot define lambdas. And because of that, I don't have the new, uh, new, new thing problem, which is also why I can have this type system. Because um, you probably guessed that if I, if I did that when you, I can create lambdas themselves, it would muck it up. Um, how Idris gets around it is that I believe that it, it does fresh types for every single time, but it, it becomes significantly more complex. And yeah. uh, to be honest, it, it really depends on your use case. If you've only got a query parameter use case, like something like this, which I've had many times anyway, uh, then you don't, need, you don't need to think about it. Okay, thank you. Hey, any more questions? No, I, I am, I'm actually curious. So every, you said you've done this three times in the past. Yep. Does that mean that you've implemented Lisp in three different languages? Yep, I have. Um, 
the first time I implemented it, uh, I think was the worst because I didn't know it was a Lisp. And so I sort of mucked around until I got something to work. And that was my at my first workplace. So I'm sorry to anyone who uh, encounters that code later on. <laughs> um, the second time it was much better, but uh, I did it in Java. And Java is a horrible language to do it in. <laughs> Um, and I think that the same implementation in Java is maybe about a thousand lines or so, um, because of just just the amount of boilerplate that you get from writing it. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. There's a. Oh. I was wondering if you've uh, ever looked at GraphQL because it feels like yeah. this is kind of in the same territory, but yes, is uh, a standardized uh, data manipulation and safe and like SQL, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the answer is yes. I've looked at GraphQL. Um, I like it, um, unsurprisingly. Um, so I agree that like if you have, so one thing which I've always struggled with is that when you introduce like a new technology, it sometimes is quite complex, and there's a barrier between introducing a new technology and essentially rolling your own. And sometimes like the trade-off that you get from implementing your own version of GraphQL if you have a really constrained use case, in my experience, has been better. Um, because for example, rather than having, like, let's say that you constrain the forms that you have, then you might be able to write a really fast query in Mongo. Uh, I've needed to do that in the past. Uh, or you might be able to write a really fast, um, like be able to uh, use this so that it will implement, uh, it will be able to work on both your in-memory hash, hash set or, you know, or also your SQL database. It basically depends on you know what 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 actual trade-offs you actually want. The other thing that you can do, um, which I think is quite nice, is that you can take the hard work that people have done in writing these languages, and you can implement your own compiler for it. Um, like for example, if you really like GraphQL syntax and you think that they've got like a really nice ST and stuff like that, then like I, I encourage you to use their uh, syntax, and you can just write your own compiler for your own things. So. OK. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you for that talk. I thought that was wonderful. Thank you very much. OK, so we'll have a quick break.